Welcome to the Humans of Hospitality podcast with me, Mark Cripp, and uh, another sort of special coronavirus-related episode today where we're just going to dive into uh, how a guest is coping in the current circumstance and chat about how it's uh, affecting their business. Uh, And I'm talking to Jack Stein today. So uh, Rick Stein is in lockdown in Australia, and uh, Jack's been very vocal in the last 10 days or so. I've read a number of articles Um, about some grief that he was getting in the press predominantly just by being honest really about how they were going to try and pay their team uh, and the cash flow challenges that they were having Uh, and an article went out and I I read uh, and heard a little bit about Jack's response and loved its uh, authenticity and honesty uh, and really felt for him and and what the business was being sort of put through and what was being said about it so I thought well it'd be great to hear from the horse's mouth so to speak and, and have a chat with Jack and I've not uh, spoken uh, to Jack or Rick uh, uh, about their business so I think one day we'll do a deeper dive into the business but today um, having a little look around uh, the honesty and how they spoke about particularly the challenges of cash flow and seasonality similar to my own business you know coming from a tourism town predominantly based in the southwest of England um, just how this is going to pan out and how difficult it could be to, to restart the businesses and the longer that we we lose revenue for in the summer months the harder will be to trade out of it next winter um also an interesting chat with jack about insurance and, and almost everybody that i've spoken to doesn't have any insurance but there is a possibility um that a pandemic insurance um that, that jack and the business have may pay out so we chat about that a little bit which would be great and then some positivity around the virtual food festival and the reason that i'm getting this podcast out uh, very quickly is because that's going to be Easter Monday uh, sounds like a great event and um, yeah I wanted to chat about that a little bit and point as many people to it as possible so very much hope you enjoy our conversation um, if you can support this podcast as I've said before it used to be paid for by my uh, business but alas that is no longer in operation uh, hopefully it will be again one day but not for now so if you can go to uh, either patreon.com or to humans of .co.uk, sorry, and uh, and click on the Patreon link uh, and become a, a donator. Um, that'll be great, and we can continue to sort of chat the uh, independent hospitality sector in the UK. Okay, I very much hope you enjoy this week's conversation with Jack Stein. Jack Stein, thank you so much for joining me uh, on the podcast. Very much appreciated. Lots of people obviously know your your dad's name, but maybe less so about the uh, the business. Can you just explain what's what's your role in in the restaurants? And uh, are you predominantly based in the southwest? Is that correct? Yeah. Hi, Mark. Nice to, uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for inviting me on. Um, yeah, uh, predominantly in the southwest. I'm the chef director, so. Uh, yeah, I run. I run all the sites um, and liaises with Rick and, and my mum, dad and mum. Sorry, <laughs> um, with regard to menu changing and new recipes, blah blah blah, etc. So, and then just and then I have a team underneath me, exec chef and group chef that run the kind of the kitchens, um, and I just oversee and direct that. You know, uh, direct that for the what well, what was up until the future, up until about three weeks ago. Yeah, and how many how many restaurants have you got? So there's sort of 12 and a half. We've got, uh, yeah, and that's mostly in Cornwall, but we've got um, we've got one down near you in, in, in Bournemouth at Sandbanks, Marlborough, Winchester and Barnes, and then we've got the rest are in Cornwall. But um, yeah, they vary from from like, you know, fish and, we've got a fish bar and a fish and chip shop and then up right up to the full all guns blazing seafood restaurant and Sandbanks, which are our two flagships. Yeah. And still, a, is it B&B or hotel? Or? Yeah, we've got f- nearly 50 rooms uh, dotted around Padstow. Very... You know, not not in one building. They're all buildings we've bought and then sort of um and turned into rooms just as it, as and when we needed it. And you know, that was kind of probably the savior of the business going through um other crisis periods before, um especially the, the recessions that we've been through because we've been forty five years. It's this year. It's our forty five fifth anniversary, which in restaurant terms is geological times time. That's period. incredible. Um and yeah. so yeah, we've got a lot of rooms. That's really that's really helped us because they're they're fairly low you know in terms of, of wage input um compared to to margin um on room rate yeah 45 years is crazy that, that is that why rick had a few and your mum had a few kids just to make yeah. sure that they could carry on because most people even if it hasn't gone under in that time most people are so knackered that they end up getting out of the industry before then i think yeah and i think yeah i think especially cornwall i mean and anywhere probably outside of london in the 80s was not the easiest place to try and drag people down to to eat because you know the, the brits were were still finding their feet as you know with regards to to being more you know i suppose european in their outlook towards food and eating out and then and and 
you know, I, mean, I remember dad talking a lot in the early days, you know, when he was on Keith Lloyd's show and this, that, and the other, they couldn't, you know, he had, we had to grow parsley at home. You couldn't buy it in, from anywhere. You know, there was no one selling this kind of stuff. Like there's no, you know, you could get dried parsley in supermarkets, but nothing fresh. So it, it must be, it was a big slog for them. And then the, he got his break on TV in 94. And then, and then it, everything became a bit easier, I think, because people just became very fascinated with Cornwall and, and the kind of, uh, you know, people who had been on holiday here when they were younger, then sort of remembered it as being quite a nice place to come. And, you know, it is a lovely, you know, a lovely part of the world. And then it's gone from strength to strength. And we've got like people like Nathan and Paul Ainsworth and these, uh, you know, who are just unbelievably good chefs and they're just nice people. And they've made the whole of my part of Cornwall just really well known for food and drink. So it's been a long, long schlep for them, but they've, um, but, you know, they've given a lot to the industry and uh, I've got, I mean, got an immense amount of respect for both of them just because it's, it wasn't easy back then, but, you know, they're reaping rewards now. Well, they were. Well, they was going to say they, they, they were. It's certainly well. not easy at the moment. So, yeah, safe, safe to say you know, so much of Cornwall relies on tourism. And actually, it's one of the reasons that I wanted to chat with you is that I, I, was, I read quite a lot in the in the press over the last 10 days. And uh, a lot of what you were saying in, in reaction to some press coverage that we'll come to in a minute was, was so sort of bang on, just with a sort of, you know, authenticity and honesty and reflective, not just of what's happening now, but this sort of, you know, seasonal towns and what this means longer term, which we're going to come into. But before we do... Um, this sort of cor- the, the approach of this coronavirus that we all saw happening in, in China and then probably, you know, New York and London, did, did you feel a little bit removed from it down in the southwest or, or did you see it coming from sort of quite some distance? Can you just talk about that period when it, it sort of came to light, the impact it was going to have on the business? Well, we, I mean, it's a bit of a, you know, we'll talk a bit more in depth about this a bit later, but but one of the things that we've we've always been very mindful of is, is is our winter period is very very lean we run at a loss as a business until may so we make money from may till november but we have a 650 people on our payroll and so we're you know we have to you know the winter time is, is always a bit of a you know we, we have no cash um <clears throat> so we actually um we actually have always looked at a, th- a pandemic type problem as being quite a serious risk for our business and i don't know whether it was i was in sydney working at tetsuya's um when the swine flu pandemic hit and i remember being very struck by um my you know i was at the time with a doctor and and we were talking a lot about bird flu and all this sort of stuff and i got kind of i suppose mildly paranoid about these kind of things coming out of uh, you know these kind of not necessarily just china but sars and and things like this and i think that we we i monitored this very closely because i was you know, I, I knew that it would impact our business in a huge way because we have no cash. And that's, you know, and that what was happening in China looked like from anyone that was paying real attention, the people who weren't listening to Facebook and were listening to real experts in the field, people who had already said this is going to happen. It was quite clear that the, the rate of growth and the and more to the point, the the contagiousness of the disease and the ability to spread was something quite to be quite worried about so on a personal level and especially at a board level we were very actively talking about it and the impact it might have and that's because our restaurants do stretch all the way to west london so we felt that although maybe barns might be affected before cornwall that it would eventually and i, I came to the conclusion quite soon my uncle's a, um, a professor of um physiology at oxford and we came to the conclusion quite quickly from the evidence that eventually it would be uh, something that would most people would get and quite quickly so we were quite um i suppose um not not sort of doomsday kind of scenario but we were thinking probably the worst is likely to happen and i think that other people might have had a different view but you know it's just something that we just thought this is probably going to affect our industry quite hard, not as hard as the NHS and the care industry, but a bit like Brexit, that these kind of industries that sort of really bought the force of Brexit, like hospitality section sector, but we are nothing in comparison to how the NHS and, and, and social care did. We just felt that this is going to be another real challenge for us. And as it's turned out to be. And did that awareness then? So yeah, you know, good on you for having that uh, insight. And I, I know you even had some, 
pandemic insurance. So again, we'll come to that. But was that having an impact on decision making? Because you were in essence in a period of time where you'd have been ramping up for summer, we were just coming up to Mother's Day, the clock's changing. Like you say, you're a seasonal business. Had you had you eased off a little bit in the preparations for summer? Or were you still in full flow? Uh, we, get ready for summer? We were still in full flow. Because again, you, you know, we have, you know, you have to take it, you have to take it from the, the experts and, and the government, basically, I mean, things like this, you can, you can, put, you can plan for the worst. And we were obviously planning in the back in the background for what we would do, you know, worst case scenarios. And I was, and I'm not, I'm a positive person, but I was saying to the board, look, I'm going to plan worst case scenarios here because I need to, we need to know when, you know, and then we got to a strange period where obviously the industry was up in arms about, and rightly so, we weren't closed, but we were told, people were told not to visit us if they were in certain categories, which seemed to be um, quite, um, and, you know, it's it seems to me, it would seem to me from a, a government's perspective, quite wishy-washy and, and, and very unclear. And I think that really, pissed off a load of operators who are basically saying you're you're hamstringing us here by saying people shouldn't visit us but you're not closing us um <clears throat> so we got to that page and then we had this very strange period because people then started to say why are you still open you know especially down in Cornwall because we have a very small local hospital and we have a lot of people who were you know coming down from London I mean there's no two ways about it they were coming down whether to their second homes or on holiday or whatever it would be and we were being start they were starting to get some noise on on Facebook and quite and I was in contact regularly with like Paul Ainsworth and local restaurateurs saying like if we change our decision we will tell you straight away because we don't want to say we're going to close and then have you guys pissing in the wind and then and get all this kind of aggro because people were saying it's 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 irresponsible to be open because you're encouraging people to come to Cornwall we don't have the healthcare system to deal with it so we were we were planning to close if on that friday we were like this is the you know the last chance of the government to close us and then we will close you know that, that we were planned to close the next day if nothing had happened but the fact of the matter is is the um is that you know we were we there's also you have a you have a, a when you have no cash in the bank and every day you're opening and you're running cash flow scenarios so, so what we did is we started saying the moment we started we realized this was going to affect us we just said right how much cash have we got so under with you know a, cl- a closure um we were we were you know with without the fur- uh, furlough payments we were going out of business end of april um with you know as, as keeping the padstow businesses open until we're forced to close that even if it was a 50 percent drop we were pushing that number to june you know but still we're going bust in june there's no way about it then the furlough scheme came out and that gave us enough cash flow with our overdraft to get to sort of early august we're still going i mean we're still going bust then even now you know, there's no two ways about it um but that's what we were doing because it cash is king you know when you've got when you've got you know your people to pay suppliers to pay everything like that so we felt in some respect we stay open if we haven't been close we stay open to at least give our staff more pay before the furlough or and also to pay our suppliers as best we can because we've you know, otherwise we're going bust and everyone's going to lose out. And there's not going to be, you know, a restaurant business of 650 employees, you know, turning over 30 million pounds in this area in the future. We, we sort of had a, an, an ethical dilemma. But when we, we were closed by the government, we breathed a sigh of relief because we were really, really happy that they'd done that. They should have done it earlier, in my opinion, but that's but it's, it's a moot point, you know. We can, that can... yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know, and I, you know, hats off to the government, I suppose, in this, this, you know, this, the speed I was having to make decisions, and I'm sure you were, that were changing on a daily basis. And I guess, you know, re- reflecting that on a national level, it was challenging. You're right, that that period between I think it was the Tuesday and the Friday, Tuesday was don't go to restaurants, and yeah. we weren't closed till Friday. And then you presumably had a similar dilemma to us because takeaways were allowed to open. Did, did you keep the takeaways open over the weekend, or did you literally shut everything down on the Friday? No, we planned, so we then went went into you know full let's takeaways everywhere and like speaking to all the fish suppliers and local lobster suppliers and we set up menus and this that and the other and then we were like we would sort of then go well what the furlough scheme was unclear it was unclear as to whether or not you could repurpose yourself as a you know to pay your employees as a takeaway are they then not in the furlough scheme are they in the furlough scheme you know what's the scheme what do they have to volunteer and these questions have all been answered now but at the time we just thought that we don't want to impact anyone's potential getting the furlough payment by sticking them in a takeaway for a, a week and they might then be considered not on furlough so we just made a decision to look we'll just can everything and we'll just use our staff that want to volunteer and we'll work with the nhs and we'll work with the local community groups and we'll you know we'll get some food out of our our frozen stock and and, and give it to people that really need it and so i use a sort of more of a kind of supportive network you know we joined a 
a, you know, the, the local homeless charity and, and the local guys who are making school meals for the people who can't, who normally get them for free and things like that. We just went full community and just thought, you know what, like we're not too interested in keeping making money because we knew in the background we're working on our insurance claim, we're working on our emergency bank loan and we've got the furlough scheme. So we just thought, you know, there's no, there's no need to sit and make loads and loads of money in this period of trying to do takeout when we're not really sure how that'll affect our staff so we made a call to just go everyone's on furlough and we will await the speedy implementation of the the chances scheme mm, okay what you talk about running those uh sort of cash flow projections and and again we're doing similar i suppose and, and you were one of the first people that i'd sort of seen publicly talking not about how do you survive the next sort of you know 60 days 90 days whilst we're in lockdown and people come to re- come to restaurants but actually this issue of seasonality which may not be the case if you're a, a london restaurateur or the cities around the country but you know the lake district the southwest any probably coastal tourism town has this issue that we make all of our money in the summer and that gets us through the winter yeah your your cash flow models when you're looking at how we come out of this what's that looking like are, are you sort of focusing on just getting july and august trade and if you do how do you get through next winter well i think the biggest problem and this is something that's an emergent property and we've only really started hitting on this in the last few days i think not a lot of people in the industry if they have they haven't been talking about it i actually think the biggest challenge for our industry is going to be reopening i think this period of of furlough and you know you basically you know we can survive on you know 100 grand a week in terms of just like our basic kind of ticking over to keep the business going but i actually think when the business is reopened you have to unfurlough and you know, and reopen, I think that's when the real issues are going to happen. So if that doesn't happen till the winter, then we do, we'll, we'll, we will have a real problem. And that's, um, and everyone will, but who's a seasonal business, because the costs of reopening a restaurant are, are mammoth compared to the cost of sitting here doing nothing. And I think that's something that the industry needs to start thinking about. So what we've done in preparation for that is we've created a group um, who are specifically de- led by me, specifically dedicated to reopening. We've had conversations with people like Paul Ainsworth about getting together and and, and, and getting a nice, clear message of Padstow's open for business and, and you know looking at how we can cross, um, you know, do cross um, promotion and obviously the pig groups opening here and that we're very good friends of theirs and you know lots of friends in the area. But we're looking at you know we're thinking you know, talk about cash margin, looking at your margins and saying, you know, where are we happy sitting? You know, if we're, you know, if our margins are in 70% and our room rates are giving us this margin, what about, what would 50% look like, you know, to get people through the door? You know, we'll let, no one's going to have any money when we reopen. We're going to have to re-employ everyone. It's going to be huge wage budget um, uh, coming out straight away from, from zero base, plus your suppliers. I mean, you're, so you have to be, you're going to have to box extremely clever. Um, and I think it's probably more businesses will go under or suffer really badly in that period than they will now. Because now that when the government's paying your wages, you're only, and you're, you know, you're deferring your business rates, et cetera, et cetera. You're, you know, you're not got a lot, go, you know, your home fires are pretty cheap to keep. But what think about next year when your loans, your emergency bank loans have to be paid back, you know, you've got, you know, you've got other things that you would have taken credit on for the for the for the reopening. It's going to be messy, I would say, very messy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I I completely agree with you. I think we flipped from the sort of yeah, let, you know, all of the work of how do we shut down, how do we look after the team, how do we furlough, what do we do, and. I think, you know, as, as, as entrepreneurs or business leaders, you know, we're, we're designed for that kind of, you know, rapid decision making and uh, and we can do all of that. But but the current situation of actually, you know, looking at various models of how do we trade out of this is is absolutely the point where it gets a little bit more scary, um, particularly around, you know, if we're going to open and, and you know, particularly around yeah, losing the summer, but also this issue that when we reopen, it's very unlikely we're instantaneously going to go back to previous levels of business. So we're not going to need, I'm guessing you'll be the same, all of your furloughed team instantaneously. It feels like we're going to need maybe, you know, four, six weeks to, to, to ramp them up and bring them back into the business and that that supports going to need to be ongoing. Do you think the government will, will flip off the sort of furlough support? Or do you think they'll understand that there needs to be this sort of graduated release? I mean, my, my, my personal view is that the furlough support is <clears throat> it, it was it was a great headline. The details were a bit slow to emerge, and and it's still going to take some time to get the monies in. And you know, if if the plan was to reopen in three weeks, which would have been roundabout now, then the furlough scheme seems a bit strange because it wouldn't it hasn't even started paying out yet. So I'm not sure. I'd, I would I would I would urge people in the, in the sector to 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 do the work themselves to really look at how. They as as leaders lead from the front and 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 show um, 
show that they're prepared to get stuck in because at the end of the day you you are going to you know a lot of people are going to have to do a graduated startup there's no two ways about it you know because the fixed cost of opening um you know a lot of businesses at once might you know in the winter might be difficult i mean it's not to say we couldn't do it and obviously we've we've got some assistance with our insurance policy which might mean we were better able to do it than others but i just think that it's it's a, it's a time a very exciting time in a very nerve-wracking way that I think if you can come out of this bit, if you can come out of this um, in a positive way, and you and you lead your business and uh, out of this thing, and you come out, I think the business will be be stronger. We'll have more customer loyalty because everyone's going to want to eat out. They're not going to have the money to necessarily eat out like they were, you know, five years ago in the sort of the heyday of the kind of restaurant sector. But but they will they will patronize restaurants that have that have that have seen through that seen their way through because people have been sick and tired of being sat at home at that point. Mm. if the um if we don't get released until sort of you know much later in the summer and we're sort of thinking about approaching winter do you think there's an argument for some businesses sort of you know staying locked down almost until spring next year across the kind of uh yeah yeah it's, tourist areas of the country i mean you know you've got two options as a seasonal business as you well know you've got the option of closing in the winter and making hay while the sun shines in the summer which gives you more profitability probably in the in the short term but doesn't give you the kind of long long service of of your staff you don't have you may be able to retain a few staff but you don't have you know we have staff 365 days of the year paid so that is that you know the consideration of whether or not you might leave businesses closed for the for the winter and reopen in the in the summer is is something that you would have to cross that bridge when we come to it i guess the the worst prediction would be a yeah, mid-winter reopening for purely on a cash flow perspective but you know there is there is hope that if we did manage to get open even in August or September, that we'd be able to sufficiently fill our coffers, that we'd be able to make a decision on what we would do for the winter, whether or not it might be you know semi-closed down or open at the weekends or whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, right now, we're, we're, we are trying to keep all of our businesses open all the time like we were beforehand. And the reason that, we'd, the reason that that's for us more achievable is probably because if our insurance claim is agreed, we will we will have cover for for two years. So, um, so I, you know that that but that is still to be to be finalised. But that, that would mean that we would be able to claim against our you know previous years um, um, taking. So that's our hope at the moment. Um, and if that doesn't if that doesn't come uh, does doesn't amount to a claim if its claims rejected, then we will be in a a considerably worse situation which unfortunately for many in the industry is the situation they're facing now and i don't feel great about going on about it but the reason that, that, that i do is because um i felt like we were singled out by the mail um and i know i shouldn't respond to the mail because you know it's a fucking mail at the end of the day but i felt <laughs> like i felt it was really i thought you know i felt it was really unfair to, to you know we weren't we weren't doing anything different to anyone else in the industry you know people that could afford to pay that you know our staff are still paid now they're still paid till Till the from so the pay pay come in on the tenth, so they're still paid for two weeks from now, and hopefully the furlough scheme will be there or the insurance will be there. But you know the way that the article was framed, like we were refusing to pay our staff, we just told our staff early and told them to plan because to, to because we wanted them to know that they, they had six weeks worth of wages from that point or five weeks worth of wages from that point, which they needed to stretch out to probably the first of May realistically when the furlough payments would come and be back paid. So, you know, we did that because we want, you know, we didn't want them sitting there going, oh, well, we're fine, we're fine. We were like, yeah. um, we were saying to them, we are not fine. You know, this is not, you know, that, and I think that's where the, the story came from in our internal messaging that we were saying, you know, we are in the shit here. Like, this is not a joke, you know, but we don't want to, we don't want to make you all redundant. We don't want to close the business and just do what other restaurant companies have done. We want to, to keep you all here and we will work every day to try and get this insurance or emergency loan, at which point you'll be paid in full. So, and everyone knows that everyone's with us. We don't, you know, we, we, we have, we do regular videos on our internal um, sort of Facebook, but we made our own one. It's called Placebook. It's hilarious. Um, and, um, and, and we know we've been very open with people and that's what, that's the best thing you can do because nobody, you know, when, 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 when the shit hits the fan and you're told this business goes under in August, regardless of what is happening with the government, people realize they suddenly, you know, it's, you know, if you don't tell them, people will just start making up their own thing. So we've been so honest. We've explained what cash flow is, what our modeling is, what this means for the business, what this means for them, 
how they, they can access these funds, how they can help, how we can help them with mortgage repayments, holidays, how our finance department can help them with credit cards and everything like that. You know, we're just trying to help them, but we're under no illusions that we still go bust in August. Yeah, I, I, I support all of that. I did the same. I put out a little video to my team a, a few days before the furloughing scheme was announced, actually, where I, I, I was pretty rational when I, I explained everything that was going on in the business. And initially, I only planned on putting it out internally to the team, although I ended up putting it out to our to our customers and, and eventually some 60 odd thousand people watched it because I got a bit emotional. And the key time that I got emotional was when you looked at you know, what was going to happen to the team, particularly pre-furlough. And, and it's a little tightrope to walk, isn't it? Because I, I just wanted them to have as much warning as possible that the next paycheck we paid them was likely to be the last yeah. we could afford as a business. And even to pay them, it meant that we weren't paying a lot of our suppliers and a lot of other people who equally were, were as deserving as the money. And I remember having a conversation with one of my suppliers who, who wanted paying. And they were quite a big company. And I said, look, I've got this couple who work for me. One's on the floor, one's behind the bar you know that they both work for me they've just had a baby uh, and if I pay you that means I can't pay those two people who, who you know who, who will be scared at the moment and, and normally get paid two weekly and at, at the very least you know even if we can help them with the furlough scheme it's not going to be until the end of April so I think yeah we were trying to do the right things by explaining it to our customers and I can't imagine how aggravating it must have been to see the male sort of jump on that and, and try and turn it into a negative when you're yeah. trying to do something so positive and so it, yeah. and again I think that, that, that you know a few things I mean the male's always got a bit of a hard on for Rick they just they seem to really go for him all the time and I mean it, you know that the, the, you see but then you think at the time when there's so much negative press in the in the country, and there's so much. Everything's just negative, you know. And you just think, and it, it was a political journalist as well, which which shows you that that you know they've got fuck all to do. Um, and and we put we gave him the statement we gave him was just exactly what had happened. We said about our insurance, how if the insurance or our emergency loan comes in, everyone gets paid. If nothing, if if the furlough scheme starts before the twentieth of April, everyone gets paid. We'll top up everyone to eighty percent to one hundred percent. All that stuff just didn't get in. It was just Rick Stone refuses to pay the staff. But you know, I went on on James O'Brien straight away afterwards. It's quite funny because I heard him reference it, and I'm, I go on there a bit because I, you know, I do listen to him. And I went on there, and um, and the the researcher, the researcher there, um, um, one of her, I think her, her fiance used to work for us actually, and he just said, um, he just said, oh. Is you know is he angry? Because obviously this thing. But he said himself. He said there's no you know, there's no source in this in this in this article. There's no none of our staff are going what a wanker. You know, like other restaurant companies have done who've taken a different path. Their staff have said this is unfair. Um, so I'm just letting the dog in the stream. <laughs> it's you know, important to do that. Don't worry. You know, with, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, my next door neighbour. She takes me in the water sometimes. Um, and um, we we were like. We were pissed off and I was pissed off. And I'm like, <clears throat> you know, some of these employees that I furloughed, my auntie, so Samelia, who's been with us for 37 years, some of these people I've never known my life without in my life. You know, people who have, when I was, you know, four years old kicking around the restaurant would be there, you know, in the admin department, you know, our HR lady, Sharon, she's been with us nearly 40 years. You know, this is, these aren't just numbers, you know, this, this is, these are people I know and I've, you know, I know a lot of them are some of my best friends that I've worked with my whole life some of them taught me how to cook you know it's not this isn't decisions we made lightly but if we hadn't done the furlough we would be what day is it now we'd be going bust in in 20 days you know and that would be it gone 650 people gone and that's what really fucked me off because I'm just like it's and you know you're right the supplier stuff is even you know even it's been hard as well you know what I had to you know I took the decision that I was going to speak to our key suppliers personally because dad's away and our the guy who does it is our stock uh our operation stock guy he's you know he understands he's a, he's a really great figures guy but you know i'm talking you're talking about people that i've known my whole life i've worked with my whole life you know our fish supplier we've had him for 25 years you know i've not known a fish delivery to any of my restaurants since i've been a cook that hasn't come from one of his vans and i've known his family and i know and the same with our butcher and, and all the rest of it and you know you're saying to them look this is the score you know, this, we have no cash, you know, until our emergency loan comes in, we've got, you know, half a million quid on the ledger, um, or this insurance, but but then you say, oh, the good thing is we've got this insurance. And then you start telling them about the insurance and you then, then have to say, then they say, oh, that's good. And then you have to turn around and say, I don't think a lot of people have got this. And then they said, they think shit, you know, that's even worse. Cause one thing that they've said to us, the suppliers, all of them said, at least you're communicating with us and letting us know. And I think that's what you can do in this situation is be clear. If you go quiet, that's when I think people need to be people get worried because they just think, well, you know, they're going to go under and they're going to, you know, you, the this debt is going to be a bad debt and that's the end of it. And 
it's it's so difficult, you know. And I, I I got pretty pissed off with the mail, and I got pretty angsty, and I was just like, "There's no need for this at the moment." You no, know, it's not like, and the rest of, and the rest of the industry were really supportive, you know, um, because everyone knows that they're doing it the same. But at the same t- time, we took we took a bullet for what everyone else was having to do because of Rick's name, and that's the point at which I turned around and said, "I'm now going to start talking about our insurance because I didn't mention it before because I knew other people didn't have it. I felt a bit bad." But at the end of the day, when we're being personally singled out and made to look like we're Weatherspoons or Virgin Atlantic, you know, <clears throat> and I, you know, I'm feeling. I, mean, I started to re- respond on Twitter, which you never should bother doing, and I need, you know, my you know, keyboard warriors. And then I, I was having a few people talk to me. But the good thing is, the Padster community and the local community here were just so supportive. And normally on Facebook, they they can occasionally have a bit of a go at us because you know because we're big and successful and this, that and the other, but they were so supportive because they understood that this had real implications for Padstow and the broader community because most people work here and, you know, they understand that as, as much as they might in good times be a bit pissed off because the car parks are full and you can't get around for, you know, stepping on the amount of dog and dog walkers that are everywhere. But at the end of the day, we do provide, you know, we're a 30 million pound business, which probably pumps in at least that, if not more into the local economy. So I don't know. I just, I just, like I say, I thought it was really fucking out of order. I just thought, you know what? I mean, at the end of the day, people go, it's the mail. No one reads it. But the problem is the people that come out of the, having read the mail are the people that say stupid things like, well, you know, Rick's work, like, you know, your dad's work. And then they, when you have a personal go at your dad, you get defensive anyway, you know, and you think you fuck off. And then they're like, oh, he can put his hand in his pocket. It's worth 14 million quid. I'm like, our payroll's 300,000 pound a week. You know, if you know anyone who's worth 40 million quid, bear, bear in mind, it's all in, you know, in bricks and mortar. It's not cash. If you know anyone who's got 300 grand lying about per week to, to let lend me, then I'll fucking take it any day of the week. But this is like, this is the kind of nonsense. You, and then you start saying, and then, the, and then the classic, which I dealt with a lot, we'll sell a fucking restaurant. I was like, all right, brilliant. So if you know anyone who's in the market for a restaurant that's closed at the moment, they can't possibly reopen, then I will, I'll talk to them. 100%. You line this, line this ma- imaginary sale up. And the guy's like, well, yeah, but you know. And I'm like, and also, if I sell a restaurant and somebody who is really rich buys it, who do- isn't affected by this pandemic, some you know, oligarch or whatever, we sell them a restaurant and then they turn it into a private home. We will reopen. That's 50 less people we can employ. I mean, what is the logic in that? The whole thing, you just go, and then you just suddenly just you just suddenly think, why am I bothering? Just fuck it, it's a daily mail. I'll stick something out in the caterer and on the staff canteen and and and, get, and set the record straight, and we move on. Yeah, if I could give you a standing ovation after that rant, Jack, I really would. I promise, uh, but I, I agree with you one hundred percent. And and it's all of the responses that you put out, which sort of came across my uh, my desk, where I went, oh, thank God, he's actually just out there telling the truth. And and most people. You know whether they agree with you or whether they don't agree with you, they can tell when people somebody's being authentic and when they're telling the truth and when they're just saying, you know, how it is. Yeah, I think that's, uh, why your video would have, that's why your video would have been picked up by so many people because it's that kind of these aren't numbers, these aren't these aren't these are people we're dealing with. These, that, that's the thing with the hospitality sector. People don't seem to understand is that cash flow is something no one will understand if they've never run a business that like ours and seasonal cash flow even less so. But people don't understand that we live and breathe other people and these people are they are there are families you know we work we work closer that with most of our kitchen staff and front of house staff than we see our own our own you know kids and 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 parents obviously my parents work there but you know what i mean but but it's like in these these aren't these aren't just you know it's not these aren't accountancy numbers this is this is this is real people's lives and the story you shared about the couple that worked for you is exactly the kind of stories that are happening all over our sector at the moment and everybody is in the same position that they are going with so thankful that the government's done and we're just now going we hope that this doesn't last too long and we hope that we can come out of this as strong as as humanely possible and we hope that people are going to go you know what the hospitality sector has taken a real pasting t- twice once from brexit once from this um and we need to patronize them when we reopen yeah i hope so and i hope that they support you know the kind of independent hospitality sector because in the i mean, what we've seen it in the last couple of years one of my questions really i suppose is that the backdrop to hospitality in the last couple of years has been an incredibly tough sector and we've seen some high profile players you know jamie oliver's coluccio's patisserie valerie multiple kind of more more chain style places i suppose going under but it's felt like the market has been flooded with these sort of vc growth chain restaurants for the last two years which is pushing out a lot of the independence um do you think that that, that, that there might be a reset here 
and people will come out the other side and kind of, you know, support those more sort of family orientated. You talked about the suppliers that you've worked with and some of the people you've employed for multiple decades. You know, that feels like the sort of places we should be supporting rather than just the, the, the latest kind of fad idea that's been rolled out by a boardless bunch of directors in London. Do you think there might be a change? Yeah, well, I think the VC kind of in, uh, influence kind of um, hospitality sector has been, they've been burnt. So they aren't, they aren't coming back to the sector for a while, which is a good thing because... The problem is, is that you know when you're self-funding, you have to you have to make decisions based on on a long term. Whereas VCs, are, they're looking at five year cash model. You know, they're going right. If I make if this if this business if I put fifty million in, it gives me ten percent a year for five years. Th- then I'll beat the bank. I'll beat the beat the market. It makes more sense than putting it into you know stocks and shares or the, or a bank you know kind of scheme. So those and the, but the problem is with that is that it's 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 not as easy as when 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 you start after making you start having to make decisions based on quality and i think one of the problems that happened at places like that like it's, it's down to quality and consistency and it's like when you start buying that cheaper you know piece of fish or you start buying that frozen this that and the other and you and that, that you then it's not necessarily that the customers really pick up on it but i feel like the staff do i mean we took a guy from from another restaurant chain as a head chef for us and he was telling me some of the the things that that that, that, that had happened since they they'd got this big a bunch of money for expansion, and and it was just corner cutting. And it wasn't so much that I don't think the punters in that kind of level of establishment would necessarily know. They may do. I'm not sure. I don't I don't know if I would if I was eating there. But the the chef was had his morale was just gone. You know, he just said, and that just filtered through to the team. So I think you're right. I think that kind of I do think that the independents, the family businesses, the businesses that that basically own themselves um, are probably best placed at the moment because they've got hopefully some assets that they can leverage for reopening you know that's what we're gonna probably have to do if, if things really get bad um and it's a bit like monopoly you know you're turning over the cards you're mortgaging and you're hoping that your cash flow is going to come back but yeah i hope I, I really hope so i really hope that there's um i really hope that there's a um, and i think there will be i think one of the things to come out of this is that people are social animals and they like you know i think the pub sector will do particularly well i would say straight away because the breweries um the pubs that people just people are just talking about the pub that's all they talk about you know that's the biggest thing i think people miss and the british love pubs you know and that so i think the pub sector will probably see the first the most instant kind of um shot in the arm but i do think yeah the independence i think these the chain the big chains and the and the kind of vc back chains are just yeah they're they're probably going to be the big casualties but but unfortunately they employ a lot of people and they put a lot of money into the supply chain even if it's not necessarily the you know high quality supply chain it's still food service and anyone anyone going bust as a result of this is a tragedy for many people regardless of where they sit on the kind of you know you know whether they're a hip instagram kind of place in east london or if they're you know an old fish and chip shop in whitby i mean it's 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 gonna have casualties across the board yeah agreed i hope i mean i you know i've seen my local butchers greengrocers you know fishmongers on, on our local high street you know busier than they've ever been and you're absolutely right if people don't go to the chains that that potentially means you know lost jobs but what i hope is is that actually it just frees up some space for the genuine local community venues who then can employ more people you know we've, we've seen locally our, our sort of you know restaurant industry decimated by the opening of a, of a big undercover bh2 uh, it's called it's a, it's got uh, cinema in it which is great but it's also got about 20 sort of chain restaurants and all it really did was add about four and a half thousand covers overnight to the local restaurant industry and then you saw the places around the outskirts of the town starting to fold as people got sucked in yeah. not because the food was good but just because they were you know they were sucked into uh, to the convenience of uh, of the location and then actually if we can you know put the money back into the local high street that then gets spent in that local community rather than sucked out to london and, and my biggest annoyance with the, with a lot of the vc backed hospitality is one I, I don't think it's hospitality it's just a commodity and so much of it was actually a property play it wasn't even let's make 10 percent for yeah. five years it was kind of like right we're going to go in at 50 units we're going to double to 100 and then somebody buys in at 100 and doubles to 200 and every time they do it it's just you know double your money and flip it every three or four years yeah. but anyway i could rant about that as much as you could rant about the daily mail article so we better move on um, I'm conscious of time, but I do want to focus on one thing because you are the only company, and I've spoken to hundreds of people probably in the last couple of weeks, and you are the only person that has any slight glimmer of hope that they might have an insurance uh, kind of you know, opportunity here. So I think we're all rooting for you, and we all hope that, that you get it. But yeah, what's the late? How did you end up having you know pandemic insurance, and not only pandemic insurance, but one that didn't list? You, you know, most of them, if you have them at all, seem to list very specific viruses. But you have potentially 
got one and we're all gonna we're all gonna celebrate if you get it can yeah. you just explain it well i think yeah so we so about i think yeah swine flu kind of period we looked at and i think there was a you might have to fact check me here but there was a the original the normal um interruption of business insurance would have covered pandemics and then at some point they made that a premium product um that was not covered because i think that they understood that that this sort of thing was going to happen after swine flu and bird flu and SARS, et cetera, that there would be a global pandemic. And the insurance company rightly looked at the risk and said, we, we're going to charge people extra for this. And a lot of, and, and when I say extra, you're talking 40% more than your standard premium. You know, in, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds we've paid over the last 10 years for this premium. And actually since since the, the thing we had a lady who ran an insurance company helping us out and she said if i'd seen that in your bottom line five years ago that that mo- that money for this particular cover i'd have said you do not need that and that's from an insurance person and she's she's like you know you're just very fortunate that the, the wording in the policy is 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 yeah you're right it doesn't name name particular things and that's not necessary nothing's a guarantee you know the insurance company will will not want to pay but the we we you know we've we've got um a legal opinion um and the we, we've very strong legal opinion from um, a friend of our business who used to be a chairman at a huge insurance work global insurance broker um a barrister working for him uh, who thinks we got a very st- obviously a very strong case we paid for it and the fact of the matter is it is the amount of the premium the w- policy wording is very very weird so it's not 100 percent guaranteed but the fact of the matter is that the the value of the insurance versus a standard premium would make you believe that it's something it's ex- it's it's specifically for a, a, a very unusual but potential risk and that's what we will be arguing if we do if we do end up going going further with it but at the moment we are in a position where they, the broker has been a bit slow to raise the claim because i think there's been some issues regarding the way it was sold but that's beside the point but the problem is is that we, we we're now in a position where if this if this came claim is accepted just accepted then we can then speak to the bank and the bank will you know i liken it to the two things it's, it's like so first and firstly she says it's like if your house is burning down and you let your house burn down your insurance won't pay out if you phone a fire brigade, they'll mitigate the risk. So we have to act like we don't have insurance. So we have to follow the procedures. We have to close down. We have to do everything. We have to do everything that we can do just to keep the business going. We don't have insurance. It hasn't been definitely 100% agreed. So we, we carry on as if we don't. She said the second point is it's like you have third-party fire and theft and somebody you, you pay the extra for comprehensive insurance and it's a considerable amount. Your, your car is really important for your work. You have somebody crashes into you and you've, that's when you're fully comp policy would would kick in you then say somebody says right um you need the car back on the road you can put your own hand in your pocket and fix it but you would never do that until the insurance company had said you've got a claim because then you could take a loan out from the bank or go on your credit card because you know that the money is coming because they've said it's coming so we're in that position now where they haven't agreed the claim but once they do we will then ask for money up front to pay our supplier ledger and our staff um, and then our landlords and everything else. Um, and then we'll just work on the claim going forward as to how it, how you know a two-year policy uh, with a 50 million ceiling works in terms of insurance. And we're, we're confident, but not 100%. So we're not sitting around thinking that this is going to save the company. But it's, like I say, I feel, like I feel very sorry that the, the rest of the industry doesn't have this because, but at the end, at the same time, their broker must have offered it to people and people have made, make a decision that they take it or not. But like you said, the one thing I think where the legals might come in would be people who have got the cover, but it has named viruses on it. I think that would be, that would be a more, ours is a fairly, the barrister says a fairly easy case and he's he's actually been to court with this particular insurance company a few times and once so he's pretty confident but i think where you've got pandemic cover but it doesn't list coronavirus as, as one of the things i would say that there's potential a legal case maybe a, a class action type uh, deal going there for those people and uh, unfortunately the restaurant businesses that didn't, that didn't know about extra cover or didn't take it out unfortunately i think that there's not there's not a lot that they can do unless the government steps in. And the thing is, what the, the, one of the things we wrote in the Daily Mail article, which never made it into the article, was the, the media should be pressurising the government and the insurance companies to come up with a decision on this because it is going to affect – it could potentially mitigate the government's cost in terms of furloughing if the government step in and start – 
looking at how this insurance has been sold and how the policy is wording and how the all the rest of it because this is a this is potentially has the potential to help lots of businesses out who've got the extra cover and then the, there's a case of, of whether or not it's been sold in the right way by brokers and it's like it goes on and on whether or not you know if you know it's a bit like the you know if somebody's been offered it and they've turned it down and there's a you know then, then that's that's i suppose that that's the cut and dry situation but where they haven't been offered it or they've been offered the wrong type of insurance so it will go it'll run and run this will but i'm we're happy to be a, a test case and the brokers to be honest they need to get us paid because if we've paid for it and we don't get it no one's going to buy it and everyone's going to need it after this and we will make an extreme amount of noise if we don't get paid we will basically say it's not worth it there's no point taking this cover out we had it and we didn't get paid out so i think the brokers are, quite, are kind of keen for us to be seen as a, t- a kind of um you know test case but then you also have precedent you know there's going to be precedents coming off the back of this and it's going to be a huge thing for the insurance companies to deal with we just feel like we're taking our reputation is starting to take a knock from the uh, things like the mail article who liken us to weatherspoons when we're nothing like weatherspoons with the greatest will in the world um we we know if the insurance company had agreed that we had a claim two weeks ago that article never would have made it because we'd said what you're on about we're paying all of our stuff we've got an insurance claim it's just we're just waiting mm. i think i think one of the outrageous things that's going to come out of this is is the sort of you know we, we all have this presumption that insurance companies do everything they possibly can not to pay out I, I certainly don't ever remember being specifically offered pandemic insurance i need to go back through my, my details and read it but certainly we've been going back to our brokers and fundamentally and, and everybody i've spoken to has said the same that business interruption insurance you know will will insure you for a, if a, a loss or a, something happens within your business you know fire flood something that stops you trading within your business that's when it kicks in um but that a pandemic is yeah, not an insured risk so um i certainly haven't been been offered it and turned it down and when we pay tens of thousands of pounds a year in, in insurance as well so e- even if they weren't you know paying out for everything to pay out nothing at all across the industry when clearly our businesses have, have been interrupted yeah. uh, feels outrageous I think that's yeah. the government needs to, to step in obviously they're very very busy at the moment and this might all come too late and the problem is that you know if the businesses go under then, then it might be too late, and I think maybe that's insurance policy. Policy uh, insurance companies' plan is to to push the cash flow s- um, scenario so far down down the to, f- through the year that businesses are going under, and therefore it's going to be their creditors or their or the or the the um, administrators that are going to try and chase these claims, and then it becomes much more difficult to to see where the interruption of business and the ongoingness of the business are, 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 are co- correlated. But you know, I mean, the questions we've been asked about this cover by the broker. I mean, some of them, you know, we need to be able to prove that COVID nineteen was inside the building and affected the building. You're like, well, I mean, we had people off self isolating. The son of the owner had it. I mean, what else fucking proof do you need? I mean, how it's like with norovirus or something. You know, you can't prove. You know, you can't get. You, no one's getting a virologist in to swab the restaurant. I mean, these and so you, they're they've got ways that they'll try and get out of it. But it's, I mean, it's just a question of you know that when it comes to legal things, you, you let the, the experts take care, and you just say right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna plump for a, a big big hitting barrister and hope that we get hope we get some movement from them because yeah like you say i mean they i mean there could be a class action or something like that in the future i don't know i mean that's that's for for other people to deal with but we're just trying to trying to trying to get that claim over the line and so like i say if it's that hard for us and we've got it i mean that's what i'm saying like you know the industry after this there won't be a restaurant in the country that doesn't have this cover so whoever's organizing this cover needs to get us paid because if we don't get paid no one's going to bother yeah, or or it might just be absolutely eye wateringly uh, expensive. Although, yeah, we'd all be we'd all be well placed to uh, to pay it if we can. Funny enough, I heard the same thing that if somebody had actually got the coronavirus in our restaurant and that had caused the restaurant to close, that would put us in a much better position from a BI claim than actually yeah being being shut down on a national level. But like you say, how do you prove it? Um, I'm I'm conscious of. Oh, go on. No, but then but then that's the point is that the, if the government didn't close us, then every restaurant eventually would have that happen to them. So in some ways, the fact to make, you know, people thought that restaurants being closed by the government would trigger this claim. But actually what it looks like has happened is if is if you did have a case where somebody in your hotel or in your, in your guest in your restaurant had coronavirus and passed it on and it was clear that they had done that, that that would be covered. So the fact that the restaurants are closed, but the fact of the matter is it's a bigger piece of public safety stuff that was done, the reasons for doing. So unfortunately, it, it might be something we can look at retrospectively, but like I say, it's not going to help cash flow the businesses that didn't have the cover in the short term. Mm. Yeah, 100%. 
So, uh, final one, you know, for all of this, I think I think our our teams look to sort of business leaders to uh, to know the answers and to sort of steer the ship and, and lead the way, and that's particularly challenging at the moment because you know I think we're all pretty good at winging it in as, as the leaders of businesses. If we don't know the answers, we can at least pretend we do and, and go in a certain direction. That's very challenging at the moment. But on a personal level, any tips for sort of staying sane mentally and physically? You know, what what are you doing to uh, yeah to make sure that you know, the team still look to you for sort of leadership, I suppose, and to make sure that you stay strong and don't just end up rocking and sobbing under a chair somewhere. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like you say, we're learning every day. I mean, I don't, like, I don't think I've worked this, this hard in a long time in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm just constantly on the phone and, and just talking to banks and insurance companies and, and our staff and letting them know what's going on. And, and just, it's, I feel like, you know, normally I'm, I'm making decisions at an incredible rate. I mean, normally I fucking hate office-based decisions. I hate sat behind a computer i just find it like in a kitchen i can make decisions really quick i find it very comfortable but when i I just get really i don't know i just get bored bored you know but at the moment it's it's a survival mode you know it's like it feels like as close as you can imagine mentally and fit and not physically but mentally to to a survival situation way and that is really focusing my attention and i'm making decisions i'm doing stuff like I'm doing stuff like in meetings, I'm basically like saying my point and then go, I've got to go and hanging up just to keep like, just like as if and normally I'm not, I just sit in the background, don't say anything, but I've got stuff to do. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I can't sit here and talk to you for 25 minutes. I'll give you five minutes, but I've got, a, and I feel like a proper business person, which I'm normally, I like you say, I'm a bit of a winger, a bit of a winger and a prayer merchant. And I do it based on, on, on touch and feel and, and knowing people and, and that kind of what all restaurateurs do, I guess, is, is it's about hospitality and, and, and and that you know it's very t- touchy feely and when you can't do that i've suddenly turned into a bit of a i don't know whether i've been watching too much mad men or like you know <laughs> I mean, it's like i've suddenly turned into this kind of pseudo donald draper kind of character and then my partner's very she finds it very funny because she's uh, you know i'm just like really short with people but not rude but just like 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 you would be in service but doing making decisions on banking and this that and the other and just you know make sure i get my question in early you know like i just like can i ask questions because i gotta go and then i'll go so it's a bit weird, but um, but I to keep myself, and then I guess you know at this time we we do a virtual food festival Monday with um Rick and Angela Hartner and, and Mitch and um, Jose Pizarro, and that's kind of a that's our focus at the moment of, alongside their community stuff and the NHS stuff we're doing, and that's that's just the way we're doing twenty minute demos every hour, um, and then showcasing a supplier that you can get online because you know we aren't you know we have had to say we're pausing our payments to our suppliers and they've been so good with us and we just think it's nice to showcase to show people that if they've got the money and they want to buy you know a lobster from fish for thought in cornwall that would be caught here in padstow then that's what they do because you know at the moment there's an amazing cash economy going on for lobsters and crabs around here but not everyone can get access to them if they live in london or another city or up country so we're, we're going to do that and really promote kind of the, the our suppliers that have the online presence to because they've got you know they've that they their retail sectors are, like you said earlier on the local retail sector i think is going to do really well out of this and that's kind of a focus for me at the moment is just to shout about our supplies and think you know you're at home we're at home but we could be cooking the same piece of fish you know and as good as you'd get in one of our restaurants because you know our restaurants are closed until the time when we can reopen and welcome people through the door that's a really good idea. When is that? Is that this Monday? Did you yeah, say? Easter Monday from Easter Monday. I feel like it's a challenge to see if I can get this podcast out before Easter Monday to give it a bit of a plug. So I'm going to do my best. Where do, where do people go if they want to find that? Is there um, a particular so website? Be through our, our, our channels. There's also a, it's called the virtualfoodfestival.org is the website, but that's been built. No, it's literally one of the things uh, <clears throat> our local a local farmer used to be one of our head chefs. He grows loads of stuff for us to eat as a kitchen garden. He comes up to me and he said, oh, well, they've just cancelled the St. Ives Food Festival. And he, I said, I know, yeah, it's a shame. A lot of my food festivals are cancelled, well, obviously most of them. And he then said, he goes, it's worse for me though because I'm a supplier, I'm not just a chef. And I thought, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that because you're doing demo, but you're also trying to sell stuff. And he's like, what about if we did something online? And I just straight away was just like, what a great idea. We'll just do it. We'll speak to our friends in the industry and we'll just basically, because food festivals are about getting people to watch a demo live and then basically walk around and buy some stuff. So this way they watch us live and we'll, at the end, we'll say, right, go and visit Fish for Thought or go and visit Ian Philip Warren's online and buy this stuff and patronize them because it's some fantastic stuff. And, you know, it, it's, we literally came up with the idea on Tuesday and it's happened Monday. And that's because everyone's sat at home doing fuck all. So it's pretty easy for <laughs> people to do it. But we just thought this is an idea that's just bound to happen if we don't do it. So we got on with it. Amazing. I love it. It's really good. Um, if people want to follow you, Jack, um, where's the best place to go on, online, a particular social handle that you're active at? Uh, Jack Stein Chef on Instagram. Yeah, everything flows through there, basically. 
Amazing. All right, good. Well, look, thanks so much for sparing the time. Um, really appreciate it. Thanks for sort of, you know, ranting on behalf of, of all of us in the industry. Yeah. Um, it's appreciated. And, and good luck coming out the other side. And next time you're in Sandbanks, um, we'll meet up for yeah. uh, halfway for a beer on the beach. Definitely, mate. You too. I hope you, uh, yeah, like I say, anytime, just call me anytime you want a, another rant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perfect. I will do. Yeah. All right, Jack. Yeah. Stay safe. See you later. Cheers. So there you have it. Huge thanks to Jack for speaking uh, so honestly, I guess, about yeah the poten- potential financial challenges uh, coming out the other side of this. I uh, really enjoyed our conversation. I uh, hope you did too. And uh, yeah, please join us again soon. I've got some more conversations coming up uh, with some other businesses and other people going through very similar challenges. And, and I hope it's good just to kind of have these conversations you know know that lots of other people are in the same boat whether you're in the hospitality sector or not you know lots and lots of businesses across the country are going through a similar situation and I think from a a mental health perspective it's good for us to have these conversations uh yeah and just understand that lots of people are going through similar challenges and if we can all work together um to try and get through them we'll be in a much better place Uh, as I've said before if you can support the podcast through patreon.com humansofhospitality.co.uk click on the patreon link and become a supporter that would be fantastic and in the same place you can sign up for our weekly newsletter so we'll send you out uh, details on the latest recordings and and links through to some of the show notes on different episodes so thanks so much and um, yeah join us again soon